Hey, and welcome uh, back to another edition of the Nectar Blueprint Lessons with Legends. And um, uh, serving a purpose of uh, essentially <clears throat> getting you some information, doctors, to um, bring you up to speed on some of the latest and greatest that I'm learning from legends out there in the industry. I'm bringing legends on so you can learn from them as well. Um, today we're talking about degenerative joints, and I love this concept um, uh, as we develop new techniques. Bio, I've said this a lot, you know, biotech uh, was probably one of the most exciting times when I was uh, just graduating school. Um, I went to doctorate school during the um, biotech revolution. It was where the dot-com boom was, and and tech was just going, so people were investing in um, this technology and investing in these corporations that get startups that launch and millions of dollars and you know hundreds of millions of dollars and new techniques and and things like that and it and it continued but um, big pharma was one of these things that continued to dominate just because they had the um, political I should say horsepower to be able to get things done. I once had learned um, and read that for every um, uh, every person, uh, specifically every um, senator, um, congressman in D.C., they were able to sponsor uh, 17 different lobbyists per um, person in D.C., so you imagine they had seven, 17 um, individuals um, lobbying for um, pharmaceutical rights. Now, obviously, it's flash forward into COVID and the um, exposure of the political pharma, political corporate um, involvement, government, corporate government um, pharma in involvement and um we've exposed or it's been exposed and most get that um and uh there was a there was a massive shift and obviously we this is a um a podcast at a different time but this leads to where i was going with with um what medicine traditionally has offered for degenerative joints and want to talk through that because it has to have this understanding that there was really not a lot of progression as far as um being able to take care of joints. And this is what I mean, like joint replacements even. Um, the cost of joint replacements continue to go up, but the technology hasn't really advanced in medicine. Um, uh, uh, the con uh, the, uh, let, me, let me back up for a second on that, though. Um, listen to a podcast with Joe Rogan and Brigham. If you haven't um, listened to that, look that up. But he goes through and talks about like the same plate that was designed in like 1980s to um, to be able to stabilize like a broken joint is the same plate that we use today. It's titanium, maybe a little bit different alloy and metal, but um, the costs are dramatically different. But the, the point is, is like 40, 50 years of medicine hasn't advanced in in, in doing a lot of these things. Um, and he was in medical, Brigham was in medical sales and he was talking exactly about the fact that, you know, um, the joint technology really just hasn't evolved. There's nothing that's like necessarily better, um, that's out there because it's really hard to get, um, new products pushed through the FDA, meaning they have to have double blind, con uh, placebo control trials and things like that. But there are some stuff that continues to mess people up, um, different, um, alloys that were causing all sorts of toxicity and and things like that so it's i come back to this premise that um the more that you can avoid medicine the more that you can avoid avoid um insurance because insurance is going to say we don't want to cover these types of things and the more that you can avoid surgery um the better the possibility the better the outcomes and we know that i lived in the world of of back surgeries because we would be approached by many people as a chiropractor to say look i don't want to go down the path of back surgery what can i do so finding ways that we can actually help condition <clears throat> the low back muscles get the joints moving restore the structure that has always been a goal because we knew the outcomes of low back surgeries and good surgeons back surgeons knew this as well and still know this that the outcomes are not good 90 percent still have pain 
um, after the surgery, which is the same levels of pain that they went in for, which was usually the main reason people got driven to surgery is because pain. Same thing with joints as well. And then a 50-50 shot of something complicated going going on, meaning that there was a, some nerve damage, some permanent um, uh, numbness and tingling, maybe even um, a nick of a nerve or possibility. So these surgeons know this too. And um, this is why like, hey, you got to exhaust everything prior to this. Now, flash forward, you know, um, uh, to where we are at today, there are some amazing, amazing techniques um, uh, to be able to help joints. And I want to walk you through that. Um, even um, even low back joints, like there's a multiple joints in there um, uh, that work and can degenerate too with heavier loads and all that good stuff. So when we're talking about joints and health of joints, um, if you're like me, um, I um, was a collegiate athlete high school collegiate athlete, we did some damage. Uh, I chucked myself down hills as a ski racer. And um, I remember a Crested Butte race. Um, we were training for a downhill. And uh, I'll never forget um, the time um, that our coach kind of radioed up and said, look, you guys are making too big of a move uh, over this role. So if you know anything about alpine racing, um, especially downhill, it's very fast. Um, we were actually clocking um, uh, mid to high 80s in a certain section. So they've set up speed traps just like highway patrol would. And we were hitting these high, high, high speeds. Well, that's what you want to do when you're ski racing. Um, but then when um, the mountain rolls away, you have to roll with the mountain. If you don't, you catch a lot of air. So we're always trying to minimize that. So um, as, as younger racers, we were making what we call a big move over this. And so um, we would slow down quite a bit. You catch air. And then the body comes up. Um, those of you not on YouTube with me, um, but um, just describing it, the body would raise up. And then we'd have to, you know, uh, forcefully uh, throw our hands forward and down. And then the knees would tuck up and, and you'd roll with, with um, the mountain, with the, with the slope of the hill to try to not get too much air. And then back into um, back on the ground because you were fastest on the ground. Um, and <clears throat> obviously some extreme um, downhill races, um, you master that and you win races. If you don't, you can lose, you know, tenths of a second and be um, in the back of the pack real quick. So we were training on this, um, uh, you know, the week prior to the weekend race. And I come through this and our coach said, you guys are making too big of a role. Um, basically suck it up. Um, you know, try to try to ride a lower position through, which I um, was the first to go through and do. And um, it didn't work out. <laughs> and so 150 feet later is where my ass hit the snow, the hard packed ice snow and left an indent. Um, you know, that compressed my spine and compression fractures, things like that. And as a as a strong college athlete, it was like, yeah, I was sore for a few days never went and got any treatment, never looked at anything, never got x-rays. I was like, well, I'm sore, but I can walk. I didn't have, I had some sharp pains and things like that, but nothing that was really going to take me out. Um, so uh, ice recovery, lay low, and then raced for the weekend. Um, but it wasn't later until I started taking x-rays um, as a chiropractor. I looked at my spine. I'm like, whoa, look at that. And so we caused this um, impulse in the body. Traumas do. And traumas can be um, isolated down into two different categories when we look at um, uh, forces on the body. There are instantaneous traumas like uh, car crashes, like chucking myself down the hill. Uh, rugby. Uh, I played collegiate rugby. Uh, we had a phenomenal rugby team. Went to national championship on that. Um, uh, so there was this, there's this combination of, of traumas that can happen that are instantaneous. Bad hits. Um, bad uh, hits in football, uh, you know, soccer's repetitive traumas as well, like heading the ball. Um, soccer's very aggressive. Wrestling's very aggressive in any of these sports. Um, and then we have micro traumas. So those are macro traumas, slips and falls on the ice, um, you know, weekend skiing, snowboarding, uh, athletics, things like that, car crashes, um, any of those types of things. We have a patient we're working with right now that was in a train accident, train hitter cars. That, God, she survived. But, you know, the traumas and that force that comes into the body starts a process. Okay. And we'll walk through this process. But um, 
other traumas, micro traumas. These are things like sitting at your computer all day, repetitive micro traumas. Um, uh, running equipment is a big one for a lot of people that they sit there and bounce around and, and getting beat up. We know this to be hysteresis for those doctors out there to listen. Hysteresis, look it up. Hysteresis is a constant loading and unloading of tissues where tissues will ultimately begin to fail. They can't keep up with it. Um, so we know um, one of the things um, that, makes a healthy body is a strong body. But many of you are forced into sitting on a regular basis. Um, maybe it's your work, maybe it's a career path that you've chosen and that deconditions that body. Okay. So it deconditions the body and that's micro traumas on a daily basis. So it's accumulative traumas that adds up to similar to what we'd see in a macro trauma, that big instantaneous traumas. Or as most people um, go down the path, you have a combination of both. Okay, so it's we hear this all the time. Yeah, I had a car crash when I was, you know, this and this or um, what, this age or maybe multiple car crashes. <laughs> maybe you're not a good driver. Maybe there was just unfortunate events that happened. You got rear-ended on a freeway or what have you. Those traumas uh, on top of the cumulative traumas just add up. So it's like, yeah, I played sports. I was in a little fender bender, a car crash. Um, nothing more than um, uh, we've seen traumas happen at less than 10 miles an hour, about nine miles per hour can have a, what they call Delta, um, Delta V, a velocity that is enough to damage tissue. So people are, oh yeah, there's a little fender bender. I'm like, well, that changes things. And we know it changes structure. So every joint in the body is susceptible to this. And the point is, is that when we start that damage process, the body goes into repair. Um, and oftentimes if there's torn ligaments, there's torn muscles and the joint has been damaged, the body throws in this um, scar tissue matrix um, to try to uh, splint the area. Now, if you know anything about scar tissue, scar tissue is usually haphazard. It's like just a matrix that lays down to try to repair the tissue, and it's never the same, okay? Anybody that ages, you know, it's like, hey, it's just not the same. It doesn't feel the same. doesn't work the same. And there's uh, all sorts of rehab techniques that help try to mitigate that. But if you're like me as a ski racer, you didn't do the things that were necessary. It was like, hey, I'm all right. I'm sore. It was kind of like, yeah, cool. Wow, good crash. You know, man, that was crazy. And then you just go about life. The challenge that erupts with that is by not doing the things that matrix is just haphazard. And then the joints don't work well. The muscles don't work well. The contractile components of everything, um, uh, ligaments and muscles are never the same. And um, then we, you know, flash forward. And the literature is really strong on this, that it takes up to a decade um, for the degenerative process to really start to show symptoms. Let me say that again. It takes up to a decade for the degenerative process to show symptoms. So when somebody is starting to express symptoms, meaning I'm starting to have joint pain, loss of mobility, and more specifically, losing the components of, of that joint, but, but how that impacts life. Because most people don't really care about the pain, the loss of motion. They care about like, hey, I'm not able to do what I used to do. And that's what the, what the, the flag usually starts to get raised on is the fact that like, hey, I'm losing my ability to do this. Um, and fill in the blank, be comfortable at work, focus at work, the pain starting to detract from me playing with the kids, being able to do my weekend softball, being able to play golf, it hurts every time I swing. So we start to see these things. People will usually not move until the impact in their life is high enough um, that they're willing to try to explore something and do something about it. So then we plug in medicine, and this is the, the, the destructive path that many just run into their doctor for advice on this. And the doctor's like, well, we can do a steroid. Well, we know the steroid is detrimental to the tissues long-term. And as I talked to a gentleman this morning that's running some equipment, he's like, oh, my back's killing me. And I go, well, we have options. And at the Nectar here in Elko, Nevada, we have options. Dr. Bergeron, phenomenal doctor, he's phenomenal at injecting joints and things like that. But we've had multiple conversations about this, how a steroid is not healthy. I worked for Dr. Gloria Beam um, up in Crested Butte and got to watch surgery. She was part of our, our uh, sports medicine team, phenomenal doctor. She was one of the youngest orthopedic surgeons um, uh, ever out there. I don't know if that 
you know, it's a Guinness Book of World Records or anything, but I, I just remember she was like 28, um, a board certified orthopedic surgeon. She was damn good at what she did. So it was fun to go watch and see how, uh, you know, joints were were taking care of ACLs, repairing ligaments and and doing all those types of things. Um, but one of the things she said, she she says, you know, it's detrimental. Steroids are detrimental. You got a joint that is inflamed and pain. She goes, she would say no more than three steroid injections per area per lifetime. Okay. Now, I don't know many doctors that live by that, many medical doctors that live by that. Um, this gentleman I was talking this morning has had six um, injections in the L4. He knew it, and most of them do. He goes, yeah, L4, L5. And I go, yeah, I could see the way you're walking. L4, L5, and I've had six steroid injections in that area. Now, a steroid doesn't stop any of the degenerative process that I'm going to walk you through today. It does not do anything that but dump the um, – the inflammatory process for a little bit of time. Now, oftentimes people will say, yeah, I got a month, maybe a couple months. Some people are like six, six months of relief, all right? But that didn't stop the degenerative process. And so what happens then as degeneration continues, pain comes back, then we put more steroid in, and then pain comes back, and then it gets to this point that the steroid, and I hear this all the time, right? Doctors, you hear this all the time. Well, the steroid doesn't work anymore. And that's the frustrating part because then where do we go? Well, then that's down the path of, hey, let's fail you in chiropractic. Let's fail you in physical therapy. So then the insurance will cover a surgery. And so then they go down the path and it's often too late to do PT or get that, that area um, back on track. And um, so they fail those types of things and down the path of cutting things out, opening up spaces for nerves, cutting discs out fusing areas, which again, the outcomes are, are not good. Same thing on um, knees, ankles, and, and hips and shoulders as well. Um, so this is where understanding that degenerative process, and I want to talk about proteases for a minute. And this is where um, a lot of the research has, has gone is that what stop, starts that process is these proteases are an inflammatory and immune reaction to try to deal with that, except the fact that those proteases keep working. <clears throat> and proteases basically break down much like a steroid can, too much steroid or too much in any one injection can dimple fat, it dissolves the fat around there and causes a weakening of the contractile components muscles and ligaments so we know that's that's bad right because you're losing even more of what you've already damaged but these proteases will cause um, specific things proteins to break down and even more peptides which are the precursors to the building blocks that we need um, will break down as well so these proteases are kind of the bad guy in this that get perpetuated so introduce prp prp was really good for um for a lot of people, they saw a lot of uh, a relief, but flash forward six months to a year, it really never stopped the degenerative process. Now, those of you that don't know PRP, PRP is a platelet-rich plasma where we take out um, a bit of blood, and that blood is centrifuged, and you get this beautiful gold serum, and that gold serum is mixed with, um, uh, or it's just all these little platelets. And I'll walk you through what platelets do here in a second. But platelets, uh, for, for lack of, of, of deeper explanation, platelets basically are like little new cells similar to a stem cell that can repair tissue. So awesome that we're getting those in there and they get in there and start repairing tissue. But this is a synonymous with basically you got a fire going on and it's burning down the forest. And then we start digging up the soil and planting trees. So what what happens is that we're we're repairing tissue and the proteases continue to break it down so we're not stopping the breakdown process or what we know as the degenerative process um we can even go down the path and many of you have gone down this path and and seen the amazing benefits of stem cells and we knew at the time stem cells oh my gosh look it regenerates tissues there's pre and post x-rays pre and post mris it's growing new tissue because you put a brand new cell that differentiates into wherever you put it in and it will become that. So it becomes a cartilage cell, it becomes a muscle cell, it becomes a, uh, a ligament cell and it starts repairing all these things. Well, that's good, except if we never stop the degenerative process, these proteases from going. So now we're feeding this area, trying to get repair, but still having the breakdown process going on. 
this is where I want to introduce you to um, an advanced PRP. And it's one of the most exciting things that biotech has come up with. Um, and it has to do with a component called bio scaffolding. Bio scaffolding is basically something that is made in this new process called A2M. It isolates a protein out of the body. Okay, the most common protein actually floating through our body. Um, uh, this alpha two protein um, uh, is. Um, used to make bioscaffolding. What is bioscaffolding? Bioscaffolding is similar to what your body uses in a repair process. Okay, it's uh, um, basically a, a, a extracellular matrix. So doctors that know this, the body comes in and actually uses this extracellular matrix, um, the mesh kind of material to patch things up and make things right. It's different than scar tissue though. It's our body using a more uniform um, process to lay down new proteins, new peptides, activating these proteins to build down and repair it the best way that we can. So this bioscaffolding is known to be that extracellular matrix that, that actually helps this process go. Now here's the cool part of this advanced alpha-2 um, uh, PRP is that it stops the proteases. And there's a mechanism, which I'm not going to dive into, but you need, uh, we'll get some, um, some more podcasts on this. We'll go down this path in, in the future. But I wanted to talk about this because if you're stopping that degenerative process, one, that's a win. Okay, then you can fertilize that area, fertilize the soil, and then plant the seeds and get repair. It's a win-win situation. The other problem that actually ensued with typical PRP is it never um, isolated white blood cells. Okay, so what we were doing is in the PRP is injecting these beautiful platelets, but we were also injecting white blood cells with that. Now, the white blood cells come into a joint, and what do they do? They're part of our immune system, so they trigger and signal a repair process. So a lot of people that have had PRP, and doctors, you've seen this as well, when you do PRP, you kind of educate the patients. It's going to be a little irritated. It's going to be a little inflamed for a while. Well, that was because of the white blood cells. These white blood cells would come in and um, cause an immune reaction, just like a new injury. So you had all the substance P, which causes pain, the bradykinin, which causes inflammation, histamine, which causes inflammation. So you had a natural immune response when you're putting a white blood cell in that joint um, or in the tissue that was damaged which some would say, hey, that's good because we're causing the body to go through another healing crisis or a healing process. However, if those white blood cells could be isolated out, you know, the body didn't go through that and you let the platelets and in this case, the bioscaffolding do its work, it's a whole better process. This is the advanced A2M, advanced PRP. So a couple things that um, I want to walk you through and seeing um, the benefits that we're seeing clinically on this and, and uh, talk about how this needs to be uh, an arsenal out there. One, steroids are going to break down the tissue and cause more damage. So get that out. We don't use steroids um, unless it's a last-ditch effort to get some pain relief before um, somebody is going down like, hey, this joint is not salvageable and we'll go towards um, surgery. But if we can isolate this protein, build this scaffolding, bioscaffolding, and get it injected with the platelets with the, um, um, in that area, which is the advanced PRP, then we're stopping the degenerative process, and the bioscaffolding unfolds in that area and has a release over a four- to six-month period. What does this mean for outcomes? Well, you're talking about no inflammatory process by um, putting the white blood cells in there. We have platelets that are working on repairing the tissue, and then the bioscaffolding that unfolds stops the proteases from going and lays down this extracellular matrix. It's one of the most beautiful processes that I've ever been involved with to be able to regenerate a joint. So we're not only stopping the degenerative process, which is step one, now we're actually moving into regenerating the process, okay? And unfortunately, um, I believe that this should be comboed with a um, regular injection of certain peptides. Now, um, the FDA just came out and cracked down, and it's not yet like on the banned list of like, hey, we can't do these peptides, but they, they put them on the watch list, which means that they're eventually, um, here we are, uh, 
October 18th. It just came out last week. We have uh, um, pharmacies that had emailed us and said, hey, um, this is your last chance to get these because this is what's coming down. And those peptides specifically are BPC-157, Body Protective Compound-157, um, uh, uh, thymosin beta uh, 4, which is also known as TB500, and the copper peptide, which is GHK-CU, uh, a copper peptide. So uh, a couple things. If we can do the PRP and then do a regular course of two to four weeks of injecting these peptides, um, it is phenomenal what we can see. Now, um, potentially by the time you listen to this, those peptides may not be um, recommend, well, not, re not only recommended, but actually excluded, and you're under the scrutiny of the FDA. Now, doctors obviously have the autonomy to work with some of these things based on the outcomes that they get. Now, the reason why these peptides are on the watch list is because there's not enough funding for them um, to be able to go through double blind placebo control trials. Okay, now here's a little bit of the, the issue. Um, the people that are involved in isolating and manufacturing peptides don't have 17 lobbyists <laughs> per congressman, senator, to be able to say, hey, let's get this pushed through like big pharma. Or what I um, loved, Aaron Rodgers used the term um, in his little battle with uh, vaccines is pharmacrats. He goes, you and the pharmacrats. He talked about pharmacrats. I love that that term because it does sum up the fact that um, you know, um, there are, are, I guess, Democrats, if you will, <laughs> associated with big pharma, and they will do anything for big pharma as long as big pharma kicks them back money. So we know this process is going on. So behind the scenes, good doctors are going to push the limits on these things a little bit and talk about, hey, do peptides benefit people? If I was to get, you know, um, a, not me specifically, this is out of my scope of practice, but we bring in um, a, a medical doctor to be able to do these types of things. But if you're using that peptide and seeing phenomenal results with that, not only decreasing um, pain, um, decreasing um, the degenerative process, but also um, helping the repair process, who in their right mind would say, hey, that's bad medicine? I, you look back at it, a steroid is bad medicine. So if you are attempting to improve outcomes, I don't see where that could become potentially harmful. Um, yes, there's no, <laughs> you can say that there's no double blind placebo control trials on some of these peptides, but there are multiple, multiple case studies. And I know this to be true that oftentimes case studies can suffice for these double blind placebo control trials because they weigh in heavier. Um, you have more data, you have more science, you have more outcomes. And if all the outcomes are mostly positive without any of the nasty side effects, potential harm to a tissue, to a patient, um, like a steroid would do, then it proves itself to be true. It proves itself on not only um, with multitudes of big populations and big groups of people, um, we isolate out like males and females and different age groups. Um, and so those should be considered as pertinent as a double blind placebo control trial. But you're not going to see these peptides get the funding, the, uh, the money and the um, political backing that pharma does because uh, of the money situation. So as, uh, as my political science uh, teacher always taught me in high school, follow the money, just follow the money. And that's what we're doing here. So back to this A2M and peptides. If you can imagine the A2M, totally fine because we're actually building the bioscaffolding out of the person's blood. There's 110 cc's of blood extracted from the patient um, and, and uh, basically centrifuged for about eight minutes. And you get this beautiful golden serum. Uh, and then that's pushed through a filter. That filter actually takes out the white blood cells. And then you use um, one of the vials of that beautiful golden serum and heat that up. And that's what makes the bioscaffolding. The bioscaffolding is then mixed with the platelets. And those platelets and bioscaffolding can be injected into tissues, um, muscles, ligaments in the area. And it floods, okay? And also can be directly injected in joints. And it floods that area and causes exactly what we're talking about. You stop the proteases. It breaks down the proteases, so they're not causing that degenerative process to go on, stops the degenerative process and starts to seed for better things. Now, um, what we're seeing pre and post um, uh, MRIs and pre and post x-rays, 
absolutely phenomenal. So pre and post joint x-rays, take a knee, for instance, there's an increase in joint space. Now, there are some other things that we do along with this, but it's increasing that joint space. It stops the pain, and it actually increases mobility. So these people are getting back. Now, we combo that with, a, um, with a, <clears throat> some decompression of those joints. We do that with a, um, a brace that unlocks the knee. We do that with um, some traction in the office. And then it's down the path of conditioning. So we got to get that area stronger, strengthening the muscles, um, uh, figuring out imbalances, um, so mobility. Uh, hamstrings are weak, typically with most people, quads um, uh, quads are weak, but the ratio is often off. So we start restoring these things and then adding some good nutrition. Okay, so the other component, hey, let's talk about your nutrition, what you're eating. Can we do an anti-inflammatory diet? You doctors know how to implement these things. But building a program for people to be able to combo all this. So we're doing the combination of, all right, now that you're injected, let's go down this path. We know that that bioscaffolding is going to have its effect over a four to six month period. But during that four to six months, let's get you stronger. Let's get you more mobile, fix the imbalances, use things like cold laser, red light therapies, things like that. Cold laser, red light therapies will improve circulation to the area, improves uh, the uh, body's immune response to that area. So then we're also causing a lot of healing to go on in that, that joint. And then, like I said, deconditioned areas become conditioned. And then we're not adding to it with the fuel of processed foods and chemicals out there, teaching people how to eat better, um, how to make better decisions, what foods actually impact joints and and adding a variety of things. I'm super excited because one of the other things that we're adding now in is a is a turmeric IV where we can actually infiltrate um, the body with a high dose of turmeric, which everybody knows has multitudes of benefits throughout the body, pre predominantly anti-inflammatory as well, all sorts of healing components. We know that inflammation from diet is detrimental to joints and can cause a lot of this degenerative process. So what we're seeing though, and the byproduct of this is when we teach people all these types of things like, hey doc, you know, not only is my knee doing better, which was the target and the reason that people come in because they were losing life, not being able to move this joint and do the activities that they desired to do. But they're also like, hey, my back pain's going away. My shoulder feels better now. Well, of course, you know, um, diet and nutrition specifically has a big impact on that. So we're not just saying, hey, we're going to throw all this stuff in there and then you come back when when it's necessary, the typical metal model, medical model, which is inject and leave. We're actually injecting something um, that is made from your own body, the most prevalent protein that's out there, into that, stopping the degenerative process, uh, creating um, this uh, environment for now the platelets to signal and get repair to the areas, cartilage, muscle, other tissue, articular cartilage, um, uh, cartilage like uh, um, uh, meniscoids and stuff like that, and and then um, ligament and muscle to repair by what this extracellular matrix. And we're not degrading the peptides, which is a precursor to repair process, and not degrading the pre uh, proteins that are in there that are necessary to rebuild in the building blocks for life. So do you see how this is absolutely phenomenal, but it's off the mark? Okay, most people, again, are going to run towards the medical uh, society and ask for solutions that they just don't have. Now, great medical doctors like Dr. Bergeron that we have here at the office is, is um, yeah, 30, I want to put him at 37 years in practice and evolving understanding that like, hey, the old patterns of what I learned and what worked, you know, 20 years ago, um, I can do different things. Now, put in peptides, and this is why I'm talking about peptides. Peptides are super safe. They're made by the body. They're existing in the body. We're just using them to flood into certain areas. Um, I say this all the time that um, insulin is a peptide. If you don't think insulin um, you know, is a bad thing. <laughs> Most of us know insulin is a really good thing. It picks up blood sugar. It's a survival mechanism. You will die without it. Type one diabetics um, know that um, insulin is a, a peptide. So if you look at it, peptides are all over our body. So we're using natural peptides. The two, uh, the three that I talked about, I will go into briefly. Um, that you have to consider, and if you can get it, and it's it's safe and within your 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 working mechanisms, I guess, if you will, with state boards and things like that, make the call for the patient. Um, but I'm at this point that can patients do it on themselves? Absolutely. Can we lead them the ways if these peptides go down? 
that they can do research on their own body. Yeah, absolutely. If I'm showing them that way, um, but not doing it, is that a win for the patient? So this body protective compound, BPC-157, was originally isolated. Now, um, our pharmacist sent me the slide from the guy that isolated this protein and um, was doing side-by-side -side tissue samples with injections of BPC body protective compound 157 and steroids. And it's absolutely phenomenal. You look at the slide of the steroids, it's like this pasty pink, meshy, mushy kind of slide. Um, very little, um, very little um, uh, mitochondria in it. So there's no oxygen, no energy. There's no um, healing process going on. It's almost a degradation process compared to the BPC slides, which are showing highly red oxygenated area. The tissue is healing. It's thriving. So we know these, there's studies after studies after studies on this BPC-157. Um, Jay Campbell talks about a Wolverine stack, which is exactly what I'm talking about, which is BPC C-157, thymosin beta-5-4, uh, which is TB-500, which is also, um, if you can imagine, the thymus gland releases cells. Those cells are part of our immune system for repair as well. So the thymosin beta-4 um, uh, or TB-500 has a phenomenal result in reducing the inflammation and helping with this repair process as well. And then the copper peptide, all sorts of immune be benefits, collagen benefits, um, all sorts of repair benefits as well. So that's what Jay Campbell talks about is a Wolverine stack. And there's, uh, if you have not checked out any of his stuff, he's, um, he's got a couple books out there. Um, I think he's probably the most researched on peptides and a lot of people have mentioned him. I've gone through his books. Phenomenal. Um, he's gathered the data. He's gathered the research and he's been in it since early 2000s as far as working with peptides. Um, so that's another avenue to add to that as well. But bottom line, you come back down just to the alpha two um, uh, advanced PRP. Um, it's going to do its work. And what we're doing is uh, um, actually getting people back to life and keeping them away from surgery. Uh, phenomenal, phenomenal uh, program. You know, doctors, if you um, are listening to this and you haven't been exposed to these concepts before, um, definitely do drop me uh, an email, drop me a message. You can comment on YouTube. You can comment on the podcast. I'm all over Facebook, Dr. Todd Wendell at Gmail. You can shoot me a G, uh, um, uh, an email, and I'll be more than happy to set you up with these processes as well. But it is also part of what uh, the programs that we're putting into the Nectar Blueprint um, where we walk doctors through these procedures and help them go and connect them with the people where to get these these um, these kits to be able to do this for people. So uh, if you are somebody that's listening to this podcast that's dealing with a degenerative joint, I talk to people all the time, don't wait long, okay? Do not wait long because the more degeneration that happens in that joint, the longer this process goes on, the more um, difficulties you're going to have to to regenerate that joint. And there is a threshold where that joint does get so bad that there is, is a non-recovery. So if you are starting to see the limitations of a joint, whether it's a knee or it's a shoulder, I've dislocated my shoulder seven different times in, um, in rugby alone. I had it um, multiple times prior to that. I had some dysfunction the way I worked out as a, a, a young athlete did not serve me well. I did a lot of heavy bench press. Um, with not a lot of upper back rhomboid trap um, and rotator cuff work until I started dislocating my shoulder. Now, I can say um, in front of a lot of you that my shoulder totally functional. I can go back. I'm smart about bench press, still do heavy bench press. It's just part of what I, I like to stay strong, I, but I do a lot of other things with this shoulder. No doubt I had tears. Um, Never wanted to get an MRI. Um, I had orthopedic uh, surgeons look at that. They're like, your shoulder's jacked. I remember sitting with an orthopedic surgeon. They're like, well, what does it do? And I, she brings me back into extension and it, and it, it made the largest pop. And she goes, this has got to be cartilage. This is so we did an MRI, torn rotator cuff, cartilage issues. And I've used all these procedures to be able to rehab this and not do surgery. So I can't sit in front of you and actually talk to you about all these types of things. Just with what we see with patients without experience it myself and phenomenal what this stuff does. So if you are dealing with a joint that is starting to show signs of lack of mobility and that degenerative process where you're in a lot of pain, 
You're starting to get limited on what you can do. You need to look at this advanced PRP protocol as a step one. Now, flash forward, if that um, advanced injection, the PRP with the alpha-2 um, protein, the bioscaffolding, does its work but not all the way, then an injection of some stem cells is going to have a 100x result in that joint, literally because you're not fighting that degenerative process. You have to understand we stop the degenerative process, as we know right now with this alpha-2, stopping the proteases from de degrading tissues, breaking down those proteins and the peptides, then stem cells are going to have a more dramatic impact, impact if you need it. We've seen a lot of people go down this path and then we're objectively measuring it with x-rays and MRIs that stem cell might not even be needed. But again, the sooner that you catch this, the better it's going to be. The sooner that you stop that process, the greater the advantage of this versus waiting to that joint um, uh, uh, gets obliterated. And we see this all the time where there's a massive, for instance, Q angle um, on a medial compartment of the knee that's just so degenerative, there's nothing that can be done. You can't even inject it because you can't get a needle in it because it is as the public knows bone on bone where that degenerative process have taken hold for way too long. So consider again, as I was mentioning the fact that it takes 10 years for symptoms to start to um, manifest. So the degenerative process is going on for 10 years. If you are just starting to see the initial parts of pain as a patient or as a doctor, they're coming in. And this has to be a conversation that you have with, with your patients and, and, and the general public looking at this from a standpoint of fact, you are just starting to see the pain. You've had a decade long prog, uh, um, uh, process going on that is starting to irritate that. Get on it, move on it now. There's such great advancements in this biotechnology that we can serve people better. All right, so exposing you to these um, this alpha-2, what we're doing here in our little small town at Elko for regenerative joints, um, we have um, uh, a seminar that we're doing for the general public um, this next Wednesday uh, to be able to help people understand this process and teaching on this process as well and seeing if it's a good fit for them. Um, but the majority of people uh, will see that comboed with the peptides, the uh, beautiful uh, peptides. Peptides will lead us into the new world if we can navigate around it. Hopefully, we can navigate around the FDA and all the stupid regulations that go on that's just about money. It's not about people getting better, but all about money as well. All right. So I want to expose you to the Alpha-2 injections, the advanced PRP, um, and um, offer it as a potential um, tool in the tool bag and a lot of things in regenerating joints. Um, but um, when it comes to injecting the stero steroid, we're better than this. Science has advanced more than this. This is the way that we need to play, um, playing in advanced biotech, breaking down um, um, the barriers, so to speak, hopefully. Long term, I'm excited where peptides will take us. If we can navigate around it, there's going to be some political humps, no doubt, to go about and a lot of heat, but that's the way science goes, anyways. In that science, new science often is met with great resistance and then it becomes accepted as norm. It's just awesome. All right, in much love and light. Um, hopefully, this is beneficial for you understanding this and listening to this. And uh, um, if you are local and you're having some issues with some joints, come see us. We do a free consult to be able to go through that. Doctors, reach out to me if you have some specific questions on this as well. Again, the Nectar Blueprint um, ahead of a lot of things in medicine, giving you the most advanced techniques um, to be able to help people get back to life. Um, and uh, um, we're excited to, to do this on a weekly basis. Um, uh, if you are um, not exposed to the podcast or this is the first time um, listening to this, we are all over the place. If you're seeing it on YouTube, you can catch it on um, your Apple podcast. You can catch it on Spotify. You can catch it on anywhere that you get podcasts like SoundCloud or Google Play, anything along those lines. I also upload these into our groups to tra train doctors and to be able to do uh, expose these concepts to general public as well. So it's all over the place as well. Hit me up again, Dr. Todd Wendell at uh, gmail.com. Uh, you can find me anywhere um, you have connection to an internet. You'll be able to track me down. All right. In love and light, we will talk to you next week at the Nectar Blueprint Lessons from Legends.